Hello beautiful friends, my name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. It is once again time for me to wrap up the last five books that I've read. So today we are wrapping up books 16 through 20. <laughs> So the first one that I'm going to talk to you about is one that I actually picked up spur of the moment because I'm actually participating in a year-long bingo game hosted by the Shelfie Chronicles. This is actually the store that I purchased all of my reading stickers because I use the Always Fully Booked Reading Planner and very few stores actually make stickers that fit the Always Fully Booked Reading Planner and the Shelfie Chronicles does. I'm part of their Facebook group and they are hosting a yearly bingo game called Sweatpants and Spice. It's primarily focused around romance and every couple of weeks they pull the bingo number and the prompt associated with that and then if you have that number on your board you have to go ahead and read a book for that prompt. And so the prompt that was pulled was Brother's Best Friend. And so I needed to go ahead and quickly find a book that featured the Brother's Best Friend trope. And I did with Help Me Remember by Corinne Michaels. I would definitely classify this as romantic suspense. And after you read the first chapter, you can definitely get that vibe. Because in the very first chapter, our main character Brielle is waking up in the hospital. She has no idea what has happened or why she is there. After she is calm enough, they kind of explain to her that she and her brother were the victims of a shooting. She was there when her brother was shot and killed and only she can help identify the shooter. But the problem is, is that Brielle actually has no memory of the past three years. She can only remember up to a certain point and that point was three years ago. And so because she is their only hope of being able to catch the person who killed her brother, who was like her best friend and she's absolutely devastated, they have to kind of wait for her memory to come back and they need it to do so naturally. They can't have anything influencing her memory. And so nobody is allowed to tell her or give her any hints about what has happened the past three years. She has to kind of figure it out for herself. And naturally that is very, very, very frustrating. But helping her through all of this are actually her brother's three best friends who Brielle grew up with and who were always kind of like her brother. Although there is one named Spencer who she's always had kind of a crush on. Naturally, because of Spencer's career as an investigative journalist, she kind of tasked him with helping her to figure out what has happened the past three years. But what she doesn't know is that several months prior to all of this happening, she and Spencer actually started up a romantic relationship. And at the time of the story, they're actually engaged. They haven't told anybody about it. But of course, Brielle doesn't remember. So Spencer is there having to keep absolutely silent about all of this because Brielle cannot know. And so you're following the progression of the story as Brielle is trying to uncover her memories as Spencer is trying to help her. And then eventually you do get Spencer's perspective and what this is doing to him. So this was definitely a compulsively readable story. From chapter one, I was hooked and I just wanted to keep reading. I wanted to find out what happened. That first chapter really does a great job of tossing you in and gripping you and making you want to find out what happened to Brielle, what happened to her brother, what's been going on the past three years, all of the mystery surrounding this. I was invested in following Brielle and waiting for her to recover these memories and I was also invested in Spencer's perspective because obviously this is killing him because he cannot tell Brielle that they are actually together. They are very much in love. They are going to get married. So overall I would say this was a very strong and enjoyable reading experience. It wasn't anything necessarily crazy amazing and I would say that my one main complaint about the story, the one thing that I didn't quite understand or connect to was how Spencer was actually actively trying to date Brielle during this time. It does sound weird because naturally you know as a reader and Spencer knows that he is actually with Brielle but Brielle doesn't know that. All Brielle knows is that she grew up with Spencer because Spencer was one of her brother's best friends and that she has always had a crush on Spencer but it has never been anything more than that and in her opinion Spencer could never like her like that because he is several years older than she is. She was her brother's annoying younger sister and so she's just always had this unrequited crush and because of her memory loss she kind of still thinks she's in a relationship with her college boyfriend or she knows that something is kind of like not right in that relationship but he is still very much on her mind but yet in this story, Spencer is like, why don't we go on a date? And Brielle is kind of shocked at first, but she's like, yeah, okay. And then just kind of goes along with it. And then you're following them as they are going on dates and it's progressing into something more. And it didn't make a lot of sense to me because three years ago, this wouldn't have been in the realm of possibility. And Spencer is not supposed to be doing anything that is going to change the way Brielle's memories come back to her. He's definitely having a very hard time with that. And he's crossing some lines. But I felt like this was very unnatural. She's like, she doesn't remember anything about the relationship. And yet he's like, okay, let's go on some dates. That didn't, that seemed out of place. And it kind of lessened the angst a little bit. Like I would have liked to see it be a little bit more drawn out. And then at the very end of the story, you know, she remembers everything and everything comes back and everything works out the way that it was supposed to be. That was my main complaint. That was one of the reasons why it didn't get a higher rating. But ultimately I did settle on a four stars because like I said, it was a very strong reading experience and I was connected to both of their characters and their perspectives and I wanted to see what happened. So with my first ever time reading Corinne Michaels, I think this was a great place to start and I'm not mad about it. So four stars. These next two books I talked about heavily in the recent vlog I posted where I was 
was reading online bookish friends favorite romances so if you have already watched that vlog you will know what books I'm about to talk about and what I'm about to say the first book that I'm going to talk to you about today is cake by Jay Bankston so this is actually a rock star romance it follows our main two characters Casey and Jake and Jake is in his early 20s and he's actually a very very well-known rock star and he is headed to his hometown because his brother is getting married and he is going to be in the wedding party and then you have our main character Casey whose best friend is getting married to Jake's brother and so Casey is also going to be a part of the wedding party as well and Casey and Jake are paired together as part of the wedding party so you follow them as they have their little meet cute moment at the wedding and it's super cute and they strike up a banter and Jake kind of realizes that Casey is not like all of the other groupie girls that he has encountered and Casey realizes that Jake is a lot more friendly and personable than she thought that he was going to be that he actually has a really great sense of humor Jake himself is not really known for his personality he is definitely not the stereotypical rock star that's doing the sex drugs rock and roll thing he definitely prefers to live a more quiet life because he was actually in the spotlight as a child after he was kidnapped and managed to kill his attacker and escape so there's definitely a lot of baggage that comes with that and Jake overall doesn't have the persona of a typical rock star and so he definitely appears to be like very standoffish definitely closed off and so when Casey is talking to Jake and they have this banter back and forth she sees a different side of him so obviously there is definitely a chemistry and attraction and over the course of that 24 hours you know with the rehearsal dinner and then the wedding and things like that they start to get to know each other there's actually some kissing and more going on and then Jake has to leave for the remainder of his world tour in the Europe area and while he's there he and Casey are still talking they're video chatting and all of that stuff and then he asks Casey okay hey you know why not why don't you come to London with me for these three days of this tour and she's like sure I'll go ahead and do that so she flies to London they're having a fantastic time and then that leads Jake to saying hey Casey why don't you just stay why don't you just stay with me the whole summer and finish out this world tour and of course Casey being sensible she's like I can't do that you know I have to work I need this money and so what does Jake do gallantly offers to pay for the entirety of her summer expenses and he just transfers a lump sum like into her bank account she's like okay cool I'll just ditch my job and stay and go around the world with you but of course it's not really all sunshine and roses because Jake actually has a physical injury from his time after being kidnapped it's with his knee which was brutalized during this time and he's had a couple of knee replacements at this point and it's never going to be properly fixed so every now and then he gets like excruciating pain and it gets infected and it swells and stuff and so that's what's starting to happen here and he is taking it out on Casey like he is being completely rude to her he is pushing her away and eventually he ends up in the hospital but of course it's not so serious so he's able to continue his world tour and then that that's done and they're back and they're meeting each other's parents but then of course the knee thing gets worse and he ends up going into surgery and it's life or death and as you can tell kind of by the way that I'm explaining this and by my tone I found this to be ridiculously chaotic in fact if I could basically describe this book in one phrase it would be wish fulfillment you know we've all had that dream of a swoony rock star who we love paying attention to us and taking us around the world on a tour like we've all had that and Jay Bingston took that and she put it into a book but what she did is she made it entirely too long she fast-tracked the relationship to where all she could do for the remainder of it was add ridiculous unrelatable conflict or unrelatable circumstances like traveling around the world with a rock star and then you get back and suddenly they're thrown into this very dramatic life or death situation so like I said very very chaotic I felt like this had the potential to be so much more and to be so much stronger in fact I was actually envisioning something a lot different when I went into this romance I was expecting definitely a lot more of a slow burn but as it was it was just such a whirlwind you know Casey and Jake only have a very short amount of interaction before Jake Jake determines that she's not like other girls he determines that he wants to pay more attention to her which is something that he's never done before he's always just been interested in casual sex no emotional attachment because he can't deal with what that emotional attachment would mean and dealing with his childhood trauma but all of a sudden he's completely invested in Casey he's talking with her he's videoing her he's inviting her on his world tour and they're getting back and then they're meeting each other's parents it was just a lot and it all happened so quickly that there was just like more and more and more thrown in to satisfy 12 hours of audiobook listening time but this definitely had the potential to be so so much stronger but because of how fast it moved because of how kind of ridiculous some of the plot points were in here I just couldn't get behind it like I wanted to overall I would say it was a fairly decent reading experience it was very easy to read it was easy to fly through I was having some kind of fun with it and I loved the banter in here back and forth between Casey I thought that was really well done but just some of it was over the top and definitely too chaotic for me and so I only gave this a three stars the final book that I read for that blog was Only When It's Us by Chloe Lee. this is the very first book in her Bergman Brothers series and it follows our two main characters characters Willa and Ryder. Willa and Ryder both go to UCLA and Willa is kind of a soccer star on this campus so she is definitely a well-respected athlete and even though her studies are very important to her soccer comes first and as an athlete there are certain expectations that instructors are expected to fulfill like if she has to miss a class because of a game or something you know they're expected to help her catch up and things of that nature but she's currently in a business mathematics class with an instructor that doesn't really care that she's an athlete he's willing to do what he needs to do to help her but she has to show some interest in the course some priority for the course and so when 
when she has to miss some classes or is late or whatnot and she misses notes, instead of giving them to her, this instructor says, you need to go ahead and get those notes from Ryder. And Ryder is this burly, surly, kind of quiet guy that sits in class, doesn't really say anything. Willa doesn't know him. And she's sitting next to him. She's trying to introduce herself. She's trying to get the notes, but Ryder is completely ignoring her. Ryder does not even look at her, give her a glance. And then after the class is over, he just gets up and leaves. And naturally that leaves Willa beyond furious. Willa is a very hot headed, quick to anger, quick tempered person. She's not one to stop and think about her temper. She's not one to calm down and continue. The writer is instantly on her shit list. And to her horror, she actually gets paired with Ryder for a team assignment that that same instructor is putting them through. And he's doing this intentionally. He's intentionally pairing Ryder with Willa. And you find out why a little bit later on in the book. But as soon as Ryder and Willa are paired together, Willa finds out that Ryder is actually mostly deaf. He had a serious case of bacterial meningitis that caused him to lose his hearing. And because he can no longer really hear that well, he also doesn't speak. And so he actually never heard Willa ask for the notes. And so that kind of makes Willa reconsider it, call them a truce. And they start working together and getting to know each other. And then something happens and Willa finds something out that actually causes her to once again go on the warpath. And she is determined to get back at Ryder. And here's where the story kind of lost me because she decides to get back at Ryder by showing up to class one day in this very revealing talk, showing her assets, if you will, and kind of making him sexually frustrated. And I did not understand that at all because at this point they were frenemies to tentative friends. And all of a sudden Willa thinks the best way to get back at Ryder is to sexually frustrate him. I don't know how it took that direction, but it completely lost me. And so they end up kind of in this back and forth game of who can turn each other on the most, which was mind blowing to me because I don't know how we got to that trajectory. And I don't know how they didn't think that it was a little bit weird. So I could not wrap my head around this dynamic. What are you guys? You guys are not enemies, but you're not friends. And I wouldn't even say you're frenemies either. Like, I don't even know what the heck you are. And it made it very, very hard for me to connect to their relationship and their character. I'm having a really hard time explaining what I mean just because I was so confused myself over what was actually happening in this story. There were definitely some harder hitting elements because naturally Ryder of course is still dealing with the trauma of losing his hearing and also what the illness took away because he himself was actually on track to be a professional soccer star like Willa and his illness took that away from him. A lot of the anger and the frustration and things in this book is coming from Willa just because of her natural personality but also because what's going on with her mother. Her mother has terminal cancer. Her mother has her best friend and she knows that she's going to lose her mother. So there was that harder hitting element in there. That was probably the part of the story that I connected to the most just because I can only imagine what it would be like losing my mother. And so I got a little bit teary eyed when all of that was happening. But also at the same time, I don't feel like that plot point had a place in the story because it didn't really do anything necessarily to further the overall plot or even Willow's relationship with Ryder because what happens is Willow loses her mother and then off page, she's going through weeks and possibly months of grief where nothing happens and she and Ryder are not even in communication. So part of me is wondering why this was thrown in. Was it just to make us like feel sorry for Willa as a character? Was it meant for her to go through some character growth? And then all of a sudden they're reconnecting, they're getting back to it. And eventually it progresses, of course, into more than just friends. And then suddenly they're declaring their undying, I'm gonna love you forever love. Which of course was also very off-putting because they're just now getting together. They're just now overcoming all of this stuff. And suddenly not only do they love each other, but they're gonna love each other forever. They're gonna have babies with each other. They're gonna live the dream. This was another chaotic one, but it was just chaotic in such a different way. And it went in so many different different random directions that I didn't entirely understand. This was another one that had such strong potential to be way more than it was. And I just didn't connect with the dynamics that were going on in here. And I was just really disappointed overall because I wanted it to be so much more than it was, especially because I had heard such amazing things about this series. So unfortunately, this is another one that only got three stars for me. Next, I ended up picking up The False Witness by Victor Methos. I discovered Victor Methos last year with A Killer's Wife and I really enjoyed that. And I definitely wanted to continue with him as an author. This is a relatively short, legal thriller. And to be honest with you, I don't entirely have much to say about it because it was very forgettable. And that is definitely a negative, but my reading experience with this was actually very high. This was what I would call a popcorn thriller in that you just want to keep turning the pages. It is extremely easy to fly through because you want to know what happens. So overall, I would say my reading experience with the story was extremely positive, but yet at the end of the day, I almost remember nothing about it because it was so short and quick. You don't get the emotional engagement, don't get the character driven aspects. You don't get the complex character dynamics that I typically look for in a story. This basically follows our main character who was a former prosecutor, but after an injury, he kind of retires and he doesn't look back. But he's also kind of living a very solitary, lonely life. He rarely leaves his apartment. In fact, he's paying a teenage girl down the hall to go like get him groceries and things like that because he just doesn't want to have to deal with it. But then one day he gets a knock on the door from the sheriff who is a former friend of his. He actually used to work with the sheriff's father who was sheriff before her. And she's not on his door.
before there have been murders very reminiscent of a former serial killer known as the Reaper and they think that he might be back and it was this prosecutor that had worked on this case previously and if you're wondering why I'm not calling them by names I don't remember their names I know this is the Shepard and Gray series from Victor Methos but I can't remember which one was Shepard which one was Gray and what their first names were I think Shepard was the prosecutor and Gray was the sheriff I don't know y'all this is how kind of forgettable it was because it was just so fast it was bam 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 and you're in it and you're enjoying it and you're turning the page and you want to know what happens but then you just kind of forget everything like I remember the overall who done it and the why that's all I remember and I just finished this book last week so this was an in one ear out the other situation which I'm kind of sad about because obviously I like Victor Methos and I like his capabilities as a writer especially his ability to write a legal thriller even though my reading experience was definitely like a solid four stars I'm giving it a three because I don't remember any of it there was nothing that solidified it in my memory it was too short it was too quick there wasn't enough substance to it for me so I think I'm gonna go with three stars so obviously I had a definitely a string of mediocre books I hate to call the secret witness mediocre because I thought it was very well written and like I said very enjoyable overall but it's just not gonna stick with me luckily we are going to end this video with an unexpected gem the sweet spot by Amy Popol so I picked this as my very first selection for the aardvark book club book subscription box I have a video that I did comparing that box to book of the month I will be sure to link it down below if you were interested this is one that I was not sure about when I selected it but I read it and I really really enjoyed this it was just so unexpectedly charming and delightful and it was so much fun I would kind of classify this as a comedy of errors and I'm going to try to explain this to you as best I can but there are a lot of characters in here and it can kind of get a little bit complicated but basically it ultimately surrounds three different women and at the start of the story they really have no connection to each other but they end up being connected by one different woman and this woman ends up having a child this child ends up being left in the care of these three women unexpectedly and they all kind of bond over its care first main character is Lauren she is a wife and a mother of three and her and her husband have actually been given access to a brownstone in Greenwich Village it's a very very dated brownstone as in when you walk in it's basically like the 70s threw up in your face but that's because Lauren's husband Leo's mother used to live there and now Leo's biological father lives there but he is not going to be there for a while and so he has invited family to come and stay there and so they are moving in and meanwhile Lauren is finding some success with her ceramic pieces she makes tableware like plates and bowls and things but they're a little kitschy because they also have very lifelike paintings of bugs on them so like if you're drinking a cup of tea at the very bottom you might see a painting of a cockroach in there and she has caught the eye of Felicity and Felicity is a very high-end notable designer she has her own television show she has two very upscale boutiques in New York she is kind of putting Lauren on the map and at the very beginning of the story you're seeing Lauren and Felicity having a discussion and Felicity kind of mentions that she is seeing a man but he is a married man and Lauren kind of unbeknownst to her in her response to Felicity sets the trajectory of the rest of the story because she kind of tells Felicity to go for it you know this man is a, in a very unhappy unloving marriage and he seems to make Felicity very happy and so Lauren's kind of like okay you know go for it and that brings us to our next character Melinda so Melinda and Russell were married for 30 years until Russell suddenly decides to end their marriage because he has been having an affair with none other than Felicity and they are actually going to be parents and so Melinda is floored because all of a sudden her life is completely falling apart not only is the man that she's been married to for 30 years leaving her for a younger woman but they're having a baby and Russell never wanted kids before so she does not know what's happening and so she has sold their house and she has lost the job that she had and she is now working as a receptionist secretary at a local elementary school and that elementary school just happens to be where Lauren takes her kids and Melinda kind of finds out Lauren's connection with Felicity and Melinda is determined to ruin both Lauren and Felicity's life and so you're following Melinda as she's kind of doing these dastardly things to get back at Lauren and try to ruin her life somebody who is also in the crossfires of Melinda's rage is Olivia and Olivia works at one of Felicity's boutiques and Melinda walks into one of those boutiques one day and she is just absolutely outraged at the privilege of this store like overpriced everything and her hostility is apparent and she's just taking that hostility out on Olivia and Olivia has had enough and she's not going to take it anymore and she kind of chews Melinda out but it ends up being caught on tape and so Olivia's career is absolutely ruined she is fired from Felicity's shop she has no idea what to do she heads to talk to her dad and her dad is actually the bar owner of the sweet spot which just happens to exist below the brownstone where Lauren and her family reside and so through a combination of different events Olivia actually ends up as the caretaker to Lauren's children so Lauren and Olivia are connected and they end up finding out their connection to Melinda it goes from there when Felicity kind of goes off to film a television show in California leaving her baby with Russell and then Russell kind of abandons her baby with his ex-wife Melinda and Melinda seeks help with the baby from Lauren and Olivia so as you can tell there is a lot going on there are a lot of characters there are a lot of different things happening but this was just so amazingly sweet as you're following each individual's character's journey how they all come together to kind of help take care of this baby while Felicity and Russell are off doing their own things and then of course you are getting occasional perspectives from 
some of the other prominent characters in here. For example, Evelyn, who is Lauren's mom, is staying with Lauren and the family. So this is a very, very chaotic household that's going on here. You know, you have Lauren, her husband, her three kids, her mother, they have a dog. It sounds wild and it was, but it was just so well done and it was well put together. And all of these characters were so quirky and endearing and you can't help but love them and fall for them. This was just so amazingly delightful and I wasn't expecting it. I wasn't expecting to love this nearly as much as I did. But by the end of this, I had just fallen in love so hard with all of these characters and how they all kind of come together and figure out their own lives because every single one of them is dealing with something individually and how this unexpected circumstance of this random baby just kind of being tossed at them and this baby doesn't belong to absolutely any of them but how all of it kind of throws their life in sharp perspective and how it changes them and makes them better people and more capable and more in charge of their lives. It was just it was flippin' delightful and I highly highly recommend. I will absolutely be keeping an eye on Amy Popel in the future to see what she releases because this was fantastic. All right y'all well I felt like that description was pretty flippin' chaotic. I'm so sorry about that. You might just want to go to Goodreads and read a synopsis because I feel like I over explained that book but I wanted to try to give you a little bit of the character dynamics that were going on in here because they were just they were so wonderful but when you're reading it I promise you're not going to be confused like you're going to be easily able to keep track of everybody and what their relationships are and things like that. It was just really well done and I recommend. All right y'all that is it. That is all that I have for this video. Please comment down below and let me know if you have read any of these books and what your thoughts are. I would love to know and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I post two videos a week sometimes three if I have my shit together and I have a third video to film and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.